Welcome to the next in the Sydney Institute series of virtual talks and discussions during this time of pandemic. And tonight, today we have um, Robert Tickner. He's well known to many of our members and supporters, but I'll introduce him briefly. Robert Tickner AO grew up an, as a country boy on the New South Wales Mid North Coast and became an Aboriginal legal service lawyer and an alderman in the Sydney City Council. In 1984, he won the federal seat of Hughes for the Labor Party, and in 1990, he became the federal minister for Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander affairs in a period of the reforming governments led by Bob Hawke and Paul Keating. He has been Australia's longest serving minister in the role of uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander affairs, um, and then he became, after politics, the chief executive officer of the Australian Red Cross and led the organisation for a decade from 2005 to 2015. And Robert Tickner's at the Sydney Institute to talk about his recent book. I think it's his second book, but his recent book, Ten Doors Down, The Story of an Extraordinary Adoption Reunion, published by a scribe. And I should make the point at the start that um, proceeds, um, any surplus from the sales of the book will go to the Justice Reform Initiative. So, Robert Tickner, you're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Jared, and um, I'm very honoured uh, to be talking to the Sydney Institute followers uh, and uh, the public uh, in this uh, interview. Um, we uh, are, of course, working under very difficult circumstances uh, with the virus. But in the best traditions, um, the show must go on. Um, my book is something quite different uh, as a contribution to, uh, to Australian writing, I guess, from the kind of book that uh, many people in public life write. Uh, it's essentially a book that is focused very much on my uh, adoption reunion. Um, having grown up as a country boy, as Jared said, in north coast of New South Wales at Foster. I always grew up uh, knowing I was adopted, um, always completely accepting, comfortable and happy with that. Um, but life, uh, of course, unfolds. And it was really um, when I became a federal member of parliament and after my son Jack was born in 1992, when I looked down on this little baby and realized that this person in front of me was the first person on the planet that I knew I was directly biologically um, connected to. And I've always thought, and I, I still do believe, that um, life's outcomes are shaped by a very huge degree by um, nurture, um, more so than nature. I think your life opportunities, your living circumstances, those social determinants that I think we all agree play such a large and important role in shaping our life outcomes are still the dominant force. But, you know, you can't escape the fact when you look down on, for the first time, at your child, your baby child, um, that the sudden realisation, this thump in the chest, that there's something else hugely important in life. It was because of that... Um, enormous warmth, intensity of emotion and appreciation of these things, that I lifted the contact veto that I had that prevented contact between me um, and any um, part of my original birth family that was out there. I had no knowledge of my birth family. I only knew one family. My father, Bert Tickner, um, was a successful uh, medium business person on the north coast of New South Wales. He pioneered and uh, essentially uh, built the sun line of fiberglass caravans, those rounded fiberglass caravans from the 50s and 60s that are still on the roads today. He ran a very successful motor business in Taree as well as the caravan factory in Foster. My mum was a beautiful, loving person. I'd grown up in a very privileged way, not so much because I had uh, you know, a particularly affluent life. My parents were quite disciplined and modest, but I grew up surrounded and, and supported so much with love and the commitment of my mum and dad, Gwen and Bert Tickner. 
But I did lift that contact veto, um, which had prevented contact with my birth family in very late uh, 1992. And it wasn't long after that that I got contact from the State Community Services Department um, through the processes that had been passed uh, through the Parliament of New South Wales with cross-party support that allowed adopted people and uh, their birth families to establish contact, provided it was consented to by both parties. It was done by the intermediary services of the Department of Community Services. And I've got to say it was a, a very beautiful process in the sense that you know, people often dismiss um, public service and the public sector, um, but certainly in this case it was professionally done, expertly done, and was actually a service delivered, as I've said in other places, with love, with a real sensitivity. And uh, as we work through this virus, we also see incredible amounts of give um, you know, by people in the public sector in, in this, and the private sector too, but in this very difficult time. So what happened to me was that when I lifted this contact veto, I pretty soon was contacted within a matter of weeks and told that my mother was still alive, um, that she had also lodged a contact veto. She did not want to prevent contact, but rather to have it managed. And so a few weeks later, uh, just after Christmas of 1992, I received the uh, first uh, communication, a very short letter from my mother, and a photograph, um, which coincidentally was taken in Ash Street in Sydney, which many people would know were, was the historical headquarters of the Liberal Party, and a place where I had once visited when I was a member of the Sydney University Liberal Club. But that's another story, even though it's mentioned in the book. But when I got this first photo, you can imagine the um, way in which I had to respond. I'd been told that I had to write to my mother to tell her things about my life. And this is where these extraordinary, powerful, almost unbelievable coincidences came to light. Because as I was writing back to my mother, um, my birth mother, whose name I didn't really fully appreciate, I didn't know where she lived, um, and I thought though that enclosing photographs of my life growing up in Foster would be very valuable. So purely by random selection, I chose two photos which when my birth mother eventually got these photos, um, really almost tipped her over the edge. Because the first photo I enclosed was me on the veranda of my grandmother's house, this is of course my adopted grandmother, that's all I ever knew, at 18 Lansdowne Street in Marylands. And when my mother eventually got my letter, she was living 10 doors down, as the title of the book suggests, at 38 Lansdowne Street, Maryland, and had lived there since 1957. Now, I'd visited that house at number 18 um, almost every school holiday since I was a tiny baby to when I was 12 or 13 years old, uh, when my grandmother passed away and my auntie, who also lived in the same street, um, also moved on um, to Queensland. So you can imagine my mother had this sudden realisation that uh, her child, that she had never known, um, had been a heartbeat away, ten doors away from where she was actually living. Now this is where the story becomes um, even more coincidental and I'll we'll take you to the next letter, that I, part of the letter I enclosed in a moment. But let me just make the point now that the realisation I had as this adoption reunion unfolded was that although I had had a privileged life, my relinquishing mother, who had gone through this adoption process, had not had um, a very good life in so many ways. She had grieved for the loss of her child, um, and grieved is an understatement, but for all her adult life, since she gave birth to me, um, having grown up in Orange, in central west New South Wales, I was born in Sydney at Crown Saint Hospital when my mother was 23. My mother had grieved for the loss of me as her child, 
pretty much every day of her life in one form or another. It had just dominated so much of her life. And although she went on to have a successful life in a couple of respects, significant respects, with a wonderful, loving husband that she married, uh, Greg Kerwin, um, who was a very committed uh, person of faith, a very deeply believing uh, Catholic, um, who provided tremendous support to my mother. My mother could never have children because of the grief that she had experienced through the adoption and this seemingly irrational but from her perspective very understandable um, deep continuing grief about the loss of a child and feeling that it would happen again. So back to Foster, I write it to her for the first time, one, let, one photograph is of this house 10 doors down. The next photograph I choose is a seemingly, seemingly innocuous photograph of me with a Santa Claus. And it's clearly identified in 1955. Um, I knew where that photo was taken because my mother Gwen, my birth, my adopted mum, my adopted mother Gwen, had told me many times it was in Parramatta at David Jones. Um, and I just took this photo, thought it was a nice photo of me as a child, and enclosed it in a letter to my birth mother um, with the other photograph I've earlier spoken about. But when my mother saw this photograph, this second photograph, she had this chilling realisation that the photograph was almost identical to one she had and she rushed to her own photograph album and she found a photograph of her twin sister's son with the same Santa in exactly the same year, 1955 I think it was, um, taken at exactly the same place. And my mother had worked for Parramatta City Council for 28 years, directly opposite where this photograph was taken. And my mother had been there with her twin sister um, when the photograph of my cousin uh, was, was taken as a little boy with that same Santa. So you can imagine um, being a person who grieved for so long to have realised the connections that had occurred was just devastating for her and it took an enormous amount of work um, by the Department of Community Services and I guess, you know, love for me, which eventually came uh, in bucketfuls to her, to kind of bring her back to confidence that this was going to work out. But the actual reunion with my mother happened at a Sydney icon just down the road from the Sydney Institute on the Opera House steps. And I tell her, I think, a good story, a very truthful story, as the book is about meeting my birth mother and the incredible majesty of the moment of meeting her on the Opera House steps. What then happened to me was that I had a, a, a wonderful time with my mother for 20 years before she died in 2012. But I always say when I'm telling the story of this adoption reunion that this is my story. It's uh, not a political book, of course. I do weave in some of the things that occurred in my public life. But this is not really a book at all, certainly not about party politics or even politics generally. But it is a book about Australian history in part in what happened to women during that, that period. My story of reunion is one of amazing success, wonderful family reunions and connection and love of family. But it's not the story that most adopted people experience. You know, the statistics are pretty raw and pretty tough that um, many adopted children do not meet their birth mother. The birth mother who is trying to meet a child is, is often rejected, vice versa. You know, these lives have been complicated and in some cases incredibly challenging and sad for people on both sides. Even fewer people go on to meet their birth fathers um, and even fewer still meet their siblings if they had any. In my case, I met my birth father um, some 18 months later and that's quite a story because my mother wanted me to wait before I met him. I think that was really important for her because she needed to be empowered. Um, and the last thing I would have done would be run off to try and seek him out until I was sure that she was uh, okay about that 
and that she was managing and, and, and working through and, and loving the relationship that we had together and trusted me that nothing I would do would ever interfere with her. Um, but she gave me that permission to meet my birth father and I did meet him. Uh, again, it's another Sydney icon that I chose to, to meet on uh, Piedmont Bridge. When I was a Sydney City Councillor in my 20s, I fought a campaign with others to retain that bridge as a great part of Sydney history and I thought it was a, a nice omen that I could actually meet my birth father um, on that bridge. He's a wonderful man. Um, his name is Len. He's 92 years old. Uh, we have the most beautiful, tender relationship. Uh, he's a very thoughtful, gentle man. Um, the whole nature nurture argument is canvassed in my book. Um, I talk about you know my birth uh, father being such a, a kindred soul, uh, but the personas of my birth father and my adopted dad were quite um, uh, quite different and the same for my birth mother and my adopted mother. So trying to work through what is the manifestation of nature or nurture in my own life is very difficult, as it is for all of us. And I guess I come to the conclusion that we're pretty much a mixture of all those things. Um, there are many things I can say. I, I just want to end by saying I also have a wonderful relationship with two sisters, two brothers. Um, they form a wonderful part of my life. This whole reunion has given me incredible appreciation and depth of understanding and love of, of family. Um, you know, no one could have been more privileged than to have gone through this wonderful reunion that I have. Um, I also want to pay tribute to my um, birth family. Um, my stepdad, on my, um, who was married to my mother, is no longer alive, but he became a huge part of my life and I helped support him um, you know, well into his 90s before he eventually passed away and we were incredibly close and on my father's side my stepmother uh, was a very important part of my life as well and I needed to make sure before I published this book that my birth family in fact all my family was comfortable with the writing of the book and to be frank, if they had have said that it was going to jeopardise our family or damage our family in any way, I wouldn't have published the book. Um, but they didn't say that. They embraced it. They were proud of it. They loved the story. And um, without that support from them, um, I, I wouldn't have uh, wouldn't have been able to do this project. So a very special thanks to them. Um, I'm glad the Sydney Institute's taking an interest in the book. It, it's a story that's about family, about love of family. It's quite a riveting tale. I can almost say with great confidence it'll make you laugh. It'll certainly make you cry. But it's not a sad story. It's a powerful and uplifting story. It's called Ten Doors Down. Um, it's the story of an extraordinary adoption reunion. And I hope you enjoy it very much. Thanks so much. Uh, many thanks, Robert. We're now going to go into our question discussion period, but uh, just to remind, Ten Doors Down, the story of an ex extraordinary adoption reunion, and we'll have signed copies of Robert Tickner's book, which will be uh, advertised on our website, and they'll be available uh, very soon. So now we go to our discussion. Well, Robert, thanks for that. Look, it's a beautifully written book. I, I read it in two sittings and I enjoyed it, um, but I've got some queries about it. But first, you've told us our, your story, your personal story with your, your parents and your, finally the, your birth mother and then your birth father. But now tell us a bit about yourself because you're a significant figure in Australian political history. So as I read your book and I know a bit about you, I think we first met fleetingly during the Hawke government years about about the mid 1980s. So, as I look, read it, the political influences on you or, or the political heritage, your, your father, Bert, I think he's a, he's a member of the National Party. He was, so. yeah. And when you find your birth mother, Maida, <laughs> she turns out to be a lifelong Liberal Party voter. Absolutely. And then you, you leave home and go to Sydney University and you rock up to St Paul's Anglican College. 
Uh, well, it's not sure of anyone there believes that there is a resurrection, but they're still Anglicans. And then you go off and join the University of Sydney Liberal Liberal Club. So, so how'd you end up on the left of the Labor Party? <laughs> well, I guess I should say to begin with, this isn't a book about politics. I do weave things in just to give context and to flesh out, if you like, aspects of myself as a person. But it's, it's very straightforward. I, I've always had, you know, for better or for worse, and I don't, you know, harp on it, uh, but I've always had this compassion thing. I, I've always hated to see people hurting. And, you know, it, it really starts as simple as that, you know. Um, I grew up in a country town. I was taught to have, you know, respect for, for everybody. I mean, I'm sure, that, you know, there was poverty in the town I grew up with, and I grew up in a fairly comfortable household, but I certainly grew up with very egalitarian instincts, going to the local primary school, five doors away from my house, friends with everyone. And my dad was in fact a card-carrying member of the National Party, but, and he resigned because it was too left-wing for him, and I'm not kidding. Um, but I, um, and, and I, you know, I, but I always knew, I had an interest in public life, always, uh, including in my teens. And, but I didn't have politics really thrust down my throat at home, um, but certainly, um, you know, I knew what side of the fence my father voted on. But I came to Sydney, I, I didn't have family that I could stay with in Sydney, I ended up in St Paul's College because I had a school teacher, uh, Mrs Willis, uh, whose uh, sons gone there, one I think became a high-ranking Australian diplomat and the other an eminent scholar. And in St Paul's College, I guess I got a bit of a shock because I'd never mixed with people that weren't like I'd kind of grown up with, open and warm and friendly. And I found it a very difficult environment because I hadn't gone to a, you know, a wealthy school and and I just didn't feel kind of welcomed at the college. And uh, uh, Patrick McGorry, who's uh, well known to people, was also there at the time. And we've reminisced a little bit about it. He, you know, like he can speak for me himself. But I, I found it a very difficult time. But I did join the Liberal Club because I was interested in public life. And um, through that, I met various people. I remember Andrew Peacock was around. Don Chip was in the Liberal Party at that time. <laughs> And it was really a seminal moment of actually meeting Malcolm Fraser, as I've told my good friend Phoebe, his daughter, who has become a good friend, I used to work with her, of this moment when I met Malcolm in the Ash Street headquarters of the Liberal Party. And he seemed so, oh, I feel embarrassed, but he seemed so aloof and so distant and so arrogant, you know, and I just was turned away and, and I just thought this is not my home I, and, and it may be in hindsight and judgment made for, for perhaps the wrong reasons but as a young you know 20 year old as I was then these things do impact on you and, and then I just you know became I was very interested in, in um, education and I, you know, I guess caught up with people many people of my generation when Whitlam government came along, so you know my very first vote was for um, the Labour Party in the '72 election. So you don't just find compassion in the Labour Party or the Greens, do you? Because this comes out very clear, yeah. clearly in your book. Your birth mother, mm -hmm. who votes Liberal all mm -hmm. her life, is a very compassionate person. Yes. Um, so yeah. that's not the only driver, is it? Oh no! I mean, look, I you know, and of course I evolved. We're talking about you know when. 18, 19, 20 years of age, you know, we, we all have all been, I, in my life, I mean, I, I really believe with every fabric of my being that we have to bring out the best in people, we have to look for good in the world, and we have to try and do a better job in Australia, but also other countries as well, to take some of the deep acrimony, you know, the war zone. The, the incredible bear pits that sometimes used to describe our parliaments and try and find some common ground around you know, big issues of public policy where people of goodwill can have disagreements but where you can actually find common ground without 
either side for sacrificing their, you know, their fundamental principles. So most of my life, you know, as best I can, even though I also operated in that hothouse atmosphere of the parliament, uh, I tried to find um, common ground with others on the other side. So in the public accounts committee, which I chaired, all reports were unanimous. Roman Bishop and I um, did the uh, seminal report, uh, Auditor General, Ally of the People in the Parliament, um, you know, when, when John Hewson um, was also a member of that committee. Um, in, in chairing the parliamentary group of amnesty, I worked with both sides of the Parliament in getting the reconciliation process adopted by the Parliament. I got it unanimously supported by working with Michael Woolridge and John Hewson. You know, there are times when you can't reach agreement, but I think in the area of, you know, of, of prison reform, as we're seeing in the United States, and you alluded to this justice reform initiative, which is not yet public, but um, will be before too long, it seeks to try and generate some, um, if you like, bipartisan, some cross-party examination of our current prison system and whether or not there are evidence-based alternatives, um, as is being shown in the United States with Republicans and Democrats trying to break that recidivism, you know, mode that inter, often intergenerational um, uh, trend that we see of people being un unable to escape that, that cycle of incarceration back into the community and back in prison. So these are just examples. But the, let me finish. Your point is absolutely right. I am a very different person to what I was as a 20-year-old, as we all are. Um, around your time as a 20-year-old, you first voted for Gough Whitlam. Um, you, you become disillusioned with Malcolm Fraser. As you know, Fraser becomes Prime Minister because he's dismissed by the Governor-General, Sir John Kerr. And so in early 1976, not, a, not long after the dismissal, you, as a young lawyer, are involved in a walkout where Sir John Kerr is giving a, um, an important address with a lot of legal dignitaries there, and a lot of people walk out. So you walk out, I'm not sure whether you looked around as you were walking out, because one of the people walking out with you was Professor David Flint. <laughs> yes, I know. He's quoted in the Sydney Morning Herald. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so a lot of people change, right? Yeah, I work with David Flint in yeah. those years, yeah. I, mm. we, I mean, mustn't, um, yeah, this is not a book about no, politics. Coming so no, we're Yeah, yeah. But I just, yes, there, there are some, I think one of the things in, in analysing my motives for writing the book, clearly I'm not doing it for money. I did do it because I think it, the history of adoption practices is worth reminding people about because apart from, and I'm very balanced in what I write, um, you know, I'm, I'm very positive about my own adoption, but there were some terrible things that happened in those practices. Uh, and I write the book for that reason as well, to, to remind people of that. Um, but I also, I did think that some of these anecdotes and references mm, to people is. would appeal to yes. people like us, you know, <laughs> in the way that, uh, you know, we see people who've shifted their thinking and matured and so on, you know. And well, I think that's a good thing. You're an important political player. I didn't say that. No, I, I did. Like so it's yeah. significant. You have, to, you have to look at where you ended up. Yeah. But going, I'll come back to a bit of the politics later. Going okay. back to your mother. Now, you, you, made, you made the point that, to your birth mother, you made the point that your, um, your birth father's um, family was quite happy with the book and that involves your two sisters and your two brothers yep. and your birth father. Yeah. Now on the other side of the family your your mother had no children beyond you. Correct. She comes out of the book as a very fine woman, she very hard working, you know, very hard working sort of uh, lower middle class as it would have been called in that day woman who, you know, sort of on, on the basis of which much of Australia was built. Sure. But she also comes out as a very private woman. Extremely. So, do you think, I know she's dead, mm -hmm. but do you think she would have been happy with these re re revelations? That's the biggest ethical question I faced. And, and, it, and I did, you know, obviously debate long and hard about this. And in fact, my mother was extremely private. She didn't tell, you know, very few people about the, the adoption. And I, I tell the, uh, the story about the... Um, you know, having met a very prominent Australian Catholic bishop in my work as Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. Bishop Brennan. Yes. yes, and telling him the story, and his sister 
coincidentally live three houses away from my mother and knew nothing about the adoption. Look, I, um, I ultimately took the view that I had fulfilled my mother's wishes to maintain the privacy of this story uh, throughout all the time that I knew her till she went to her grave and while Greg, her husband, was still alive. Um, but with her passing, um, ultimately I considered that my commitments had been fulfilled and the story was now mine, that I had a life too. Um, and I thought that in writing this book, I could also pay an enormous tribute to my mother, to her integrity, to her character, to her, to her as a woman. And, and I've done that. So I'm very comfortable that I did it. But you are right to ask the question because it was a, it was a huge issue for me. Now, there's a photograph of your mother here in the book. You've got some great photographs here, including <laughs> you on a surfboard. <laughs> I, said, I said to someone the other day, I said, you know, that's a sheer indulgence to put that in, but it's my book, so I thought... Yeah. I've noticed that. I marked that as self-indulgence. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so there's your photograph on, on the... Um, uh, people looking at on the, on the left of the page of your uh, mother and on the right of the page of, of your birth mother, and she's a very beautiful young woman of uh, the mid-20s then, I think. Yeah, 20, um, yeah, that's right. But as you make the point, she was very personal, but it's not, a, it's not surprising that she didn't speak to you about the circum circumstances of your conception, hmm. but it probably is surprising she didn't speak to you about the circumstances of your birth. You know very little about that, don't you? Um, well, I, you know, it's answered in really one word, um, it's the grief, you know, that, that shame, the grief, um, you know, is, is why she, it was of enormous pain to her to talk about these issues. So I've been back to the, you know, I, she had been back to the hospital, it was still very much in her mind, it, back to the hospital in the sense of getting the original birth records um, and, um, you know, I, various things were alluded to, but my mother, my mother was extremely distressed any time we would talk about, you know, that period. And so, you know, it would be wrong of me to, to push it, uh, you know, to cause her, her grief. So, and, and may I also say the circumstances of her relationship with my birth father, I considered to be, to be absolutely their business. I didn't have any period or other interest in this. Um, you know, I was born, that's all I needed to know. My birth father held me in the hospital at that time, um, which was, um, you know, extraordinary, probably, I think, for that period. Mm. Yeah. Well, that was most unusual, because normally the fathers weren't, mm. weren't around, so... Mm. But he never... He has not spoken to you much about it either, has he? No, I haven't, I mean, and I haven't asked, you yes. know. I don't consider yeah. it... You know, I, I have a wonderful relationship with my... You know, with my... Uh, I don't, Lola, I don't call her my stepmother every day, but she's been magnificent, you know, to to have someone come into their life as another sibling for her yes. very adult children, my brothers and my sisters, and to welcome them is just so generous and so so wise. And I think it was because, you know, Lola has explained to me that she had adoption in her own family, in her wider family. And so she understood a little bit about it. But, you know, I think that's extraordinary. And the strength of their marriage, you know, Lola and my father, Len, is, is amazing. They've just celebrated 60 wonderful years together. Pretty impressive. Mm. Mm. So tell us about your father and your mother who brought you up, Burton. Yeah. When they, uh, you're a bit critical of your father's attitude to Indigenous affairs. Yeah. Uh, your mother comes out as... Um, but apart from that, they both come out as um, very good parents. Wonderful. Very, Wonderful parents. So yes, you, you were very lucky, weren't you? I was extremely lucky, and that's the point. You know, there have been very significant studies done of the lives of of um, adopted people, and uh, you know, and, and of course of, of mothers who've given up children for adoption, and particularly in the for the mothers, you know, very significant mental health issues uh, for fifty percent of people. I think are the figures that I recall researching. 
Um, and in the case of children who've been adopted, you know, similar, very complex outcomes for people. And having just been to uh, a forum where I met a number of uh, mothers who've given up children for adoption and people who were searching for the birth parents, I realised even more powerfully how my own experience is not typical of the reunion experience of most people. You know, and I, I guess in talking about my own experience, I do make it clear I'm not an expert, but some things I did learn. And one of the things was, first of all, that these things should not be rushed. And I had wonderful guidance through the Department of Community Services, um, just making me reflect and understand what my mother had been through, because it was so different to my life. And it took me a long time to appreciate the depth of her pain. I had challenges to work through, and, and you know, you were, you were right to, you know, to raise these things because they're very ethical questions. I, I had to think when I told my mother, my birth mother, Maida, about growing up and good stories about my life. Was I causing her pain, you see? Was I you know, reminding her of all that she didn't have? But in her case, um, quite remarkably, she wasn't impacted in that way. She, when we went to foster, she really valued that experience. She did not want to meet my birth mother, Gwen, and who was then in aged care and going through you know, the early stages of dementia. But that in itself was another big ethical question. Should they meet? And my mother said, no, this is not right. And of course, she was absolutely right, and they didn't meet. But for my, um, my birth mother, that ethical question of whether I should tell her the good times about growing up ended up just fine because unbeknownst to me, she got a photo of my um, adopted mum my adopted mum and dad, Gwen and Bert, who are my mum and dad forever. Um, and she quietly put that on her mantelpiece at her home in Maryland, and she put them on a pedestal in her own mind that they had been so wonderful to me. And when my birth mother eventually did um, pass away, my mother made a um, came to the funeral, which, which I thought was just, you know, wonderful. Mm. I mean, as you point out in the book, uh, you made the approach to your birth mother. Mm. When I first came to Sydney in the mid-1980s, the issue was, as you point out in your book, this matter was being discussed as to how go to the problem of, of, of adoption. Mm. Uh, now, I met him, then I knew a young man, <coughs> younger than me, um, who, was, who had been adopted and who was absolutely emphatically determined that he didn't want his birth mother or his birth father to contact him, and he was resolute that this re legislation shouldn't go through. Now, obviously, you didn't feel that at all. Well, I but did. You, I did. You did. Yes, okay. I did. I had such loyalty to my mum and dad, Gwen and Bert Tickner, that I lodged a contact veto, and I was adamant. Oh, that's yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah, yeah. you know, I thought, you know, I, they met my mum and dad. My dad was no longer alive at that time, but. My mother um, had never tried to persuade me or never raised the issue or never expressed concern about any attempt to meet my birth mother. But it was this intuitive feeling on my part that it might cause pain and this you know, abiding love and loyalty to my mother that I would never cause her any pain that prevented me f from you know, taking any steps and I lodged a contact veto. But of course the crazy thing was that when I lifted the contact veto and met my birth mother, I had this other moral, you know, tsunami of realization that I had not done anything for some years when my mother had been continuing to grieve. So this is a whole minefield of ethical questions and challenges to which there is not one true path. You know, you've got to work your way through these as the issues come up to you. But you raise good questions, yeah. You talk about, a minute ago, about your intuitive feelings, and uh, towards the end of your book, as I recall, you describe yourself as a soft person. And I think those of us who've been around you in politics always thought that you were a very decent politician. But you're also a pretty tough guy. 
Uh, you're in the left of the Labor Party. Um, I, that was 24 years ago. I'm clean. Look. <laughs> but then you go in. You, you go in, and you. You're a minister eventually in the Hawke government. You're a minister in the Keating government. Yes. They're pretty tough guys, and you've got to deal with them. Mm. You're a pretty tough guy. I mean, I think at a relatively young age, you're having a row with Prime Minister, uh, a disagreement with Prime Minister Bob Hawke. That's yeah. in your book. Uh, you, most people have disagreements with Paul Keating. So you, you might be a soft personality, but you're a pretty tough political operator. Well, can I just say that, you know, I, I don't regret, um, you know, rather than not regret, I, if I had, this is something you, know, you have to weigh up before you say, but obviously everyone does things that they're not happy with in their life, but my path was the one that allowed me to do the best that I could to work with people of goodwill to try and make Australia a better place in the areas where I could in my own very limited way. Sometimes you do, in public life, need great courage. And you, you have to put yourself on the tracks. It's that locomotive is coming down towards you and be strong. I mean, I think to be very revealing, uh, Tommy Wren, former Labor parliamentarian, prisoner of war, and, um, was someone who influenced me a lot in giving me, I think, greater strength um, and uh, preparedness to, to take a stand. I, you know, for someone you might think has been, a, you know, at various times in their life, deeply engaged with the media, you know, I'm, I'm also an incredibly private person, but I realised that you had to do those things and you sometimes had to you know, to use that phrase again, to take a stand for issues that you, you believe in. And I have no regrets about that. Um, it's not something that you know, necessarily comes easy to me. Um, and, um, but, you know, yeah, you, you're right. You, you've, got to, you've got to be strong. Tom, Tommy Renu became a bit of a mentor to you. Look, in a funny sort of way, you know, not, not, not that we're so different, you know, a very different age group and very different in so many ways. Um, but... Yeah, he's someone, someone I got to know soulfully as a human being. You know, and if he were here beside me, I would say, you know, he had an ego that you couldn't jump over, you know. Yeah. But, but you know, you need a bit of an ego, you know, in public He's a life. pretty tough guy. Yeah. I yeah, mean, I remember, well, he, he had been an Australian heavyweight boxing champion. Yeah, he yeah. wasn't the champion, he was a close to it. I think he was the heavyweight boxing champion. And he, he was tall for Darwin, I think. Yeah, yeah he, he was tall for his generation. I remember former Labour leader Bill Hayden telling me that he completely was in, completely intimidated by Tommy Rennes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's an irony, isn't it? It's yeah. A, and, he, and he was always intimidating people as he's telling people how we should all love one another. <laughs> <laughs> you got so intimidated by Tom that you had to love someone. Uh, yeah. uh, I don't. See, my, my understanding of him is such that I, I know I know that the, the public persona, um, you know, in my opinion, in knowing him all those years, um, was also reflective of what he was like as a human being on a, on a personal level. And yeah, sure, he was tough. He did, you know, he would have mannerisms that were different to mine. But you know, in this, in this many people I've admired on both sides of politics. But you know, he he did become someone I knew very well and, and deeply admired. His his love of people was extraordinary, and that was not affected or that his love of people was profound and his, was his great driver. And, and, and I hope it's mine. I believe it is. So we're getting close to the end now. So um, you seem to have a kind of sentimental streak, which I, I can understand. So you lose your seat of Hughes in 1996, which is, the, which is not, a, not surprising because there's a big swing against Labor and a lot of seats are lost, and that seat is also in, in what you call it Southwest Sydney. That that seat is also changing, and it's been uh, in the Liberal Party's hands ever since. I think that's true. But you lose that, but this profoundly affects you. I mean, you have some unfortunate circumstances as well. You spend a lot of your money on your electorate, and you, you don't have a lot of money. But you've lost your job, and you're out of work for a couple of years. Uh, although you have a pension, but you're out of work, and you don't have any great income coming in. But you and your staff find it very hard to drive past your office because it reminds you 
of what you've lost. Most people wouldn't think too much about driving past an office. Yeah, would well, you know what? You know, I see this is where I, I left the parliament. Um, I went in as an idealist, um, you know, that people can misinterpret that word, but believing in the institution of the parliament, having a great love of the parliament, and on the walls here at the Sydney Institute there's the old parliament house, and what a privilege to have been in, and served in that building. And, and, I, and I do love the institution of the parliament, and I do love the committee system, um, and I do think we have to keep evolving the parliament as, as a democratic institution. Um, but um, I, I, um, I guess um, that my book also seeks to paint a bit of the human side of being a parliamentarian. And, you know, and, you know, I know that there are so many members of parliament on both sides of the fence, um, you know, who are devoted to their electorates, not just in getting electorates, but who actually live the life. And, and that's what we tried to, to do, you know, as, as a local federal member for Hughes. I tried to make my seat like a country electorate, to just be everywhere for people. My home phone number um, was available publicly to my entire electorate. I'd written a letter to my electorate and publicised my... Uh, and so few people abuse that. Most people are good, you know, and, and respectful. And, but people did use it in an emergency. So yes, losing the seat, it, the grief was about feeling this rejection, you know, that you'd done all you could and, you know, and I, it is something, of course, you get over with time and it's another big theme of my beliefs that you do have to reinvent yourself as a person. But, um, yeah, I mean, it must have been for John Howard, uh, you know, a very extraordinarily painful thing to lose Ben on. Well, as John found, Howard found out as well, you can be a good local member and you can lose, if the swing is against you and you've got a marginal seat or near, a near marginal seat, you're going to go. So just finally, you felt sent sentimental about driving past your old office. Do you ever drive past uh, Crown Street Hospital? Well, I, of course I, I know it well. Um, in my, when I was a Sydney City Councillor back in my 20s, my, my, the area I represented literally just abutted the, um, that hospital. But for me, for me, it did not have the scars torment that it had for my mother, and uh, I don't you know, she was still scarred, um, you know, at the end of her days, but I want to just end, for my part, Jared, by saying that my mother was a spirited woman, an intelligent woman, uh, an engaging person uh, in her community, and all, in Clean Up Australia, all sorts of other local things, a devoted husband to Greg. They travelled well. They had a good life, but they were they were modest people. But you know, uh, it, I want to leave with that message that my mother was my a real hero. I mean, having lived through all these challenges, but still sustained herself, and ultimately we can have this wonderful reunion for which I am forever grateful. I think it's a very fair summary of your mother. But just before I say thank you formally. It's interesting reading the book. I mean, you describe your mother as modest. She would have had not much education, I guess, beyond the age of about, what, 15, something like that. Around but that she writes said. beautifully. Yeah. I mean, the letters you quote here are beautifully written letters. <laughs> um, and it says a lot for our educational standards in those days that, that people of that generation who left school relatively early could write so well. Right. Mm. So, I mean, just when I read these, these there are quite a number of long bits you quote from the letters, yeah, yeah, yeah. and they're just wonderfully written. Yeah, lovely. So you Thank should you, be very Jared. proud of your mother. Thank you. And your, and mothers, your father, and, and your other two fathers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and your book, Ten Doors Down, good luck with it. Thank, Thank you, you. Jerry.